During the summer, a story of alien invaders in the country of Peru got the world's attention. But then, life moved on. But are the aliens still hunting villagers to this day? And then we travel to Kansas to take a look at a bizarre story involving an ammunition factory. While these bombs were designed to be dropped on enemy combatants, instead a grisly accident caused fatalities here at home. But is it possible that the people who died in this blast still haunt the factory to this day? Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. Hope you guys are having a great day too. Hope you guys have some fun plans for the weekend. I, there's no movies out that I really want to see. Um, and so I will enter into a state of suspended animation until the next episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. But someone who's never suspended in animation, someone who's always jumping around, running into Dead Rabbit Radio command right now, everyone get on your feet and give it up for an idea guy. Woohoo, yeah, we <laughs> He's jumping around. He's jumping around showing off that he can move. An idea guy was one of our Thanksgiving live stream contributors. Thank you very much for donating to the show, An Idea Guy. You're gonna be our captain, our pilot this episode. If you guys can't support the show financially through the Patreon or through live stream donations or the merch store, that's fine too. It truly is. Just help spread the word about Dead Rabbit Radio. That helps out so much. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone you know, Dead Rabbit Radio is your favorite paranormal show. An idea, guy. I'm going to go ahead and get this party started by tossing you. What haven't we used a lot this season? Uh, uh, An idea, guy. I'm going to go ahead and toss you the oars to the Dead Rabbit rowboat. We're going to leave behind Dead Rabbit Command. Row, row, row us all the way out to Peru. Oh, splash. Oh, splash. We're rowing. It's a mighty long trip, but we're mighty, mighty people. We row all the way down to Peru. This is actually, I don't do a lot of follow-up stories. If you really think about it, I've done just a few over the course of 1100. What is this episode 1182? Not a lot of follow up stories. But this is nuts. This is totally nuts. So a quick recap. I'll put the whole episode in the show notes, but a quick recap. Back in August, I did this episode. It was episode 1118. Invasion of the Face Peelers. And it was this story, and I'm sure you guys might have come across this in the news. It was all over. It was like one of those things that popped up for a couple days. What was going on was in Alto, in the Alto Nene district, which is in Loreto, Peru, the Loreto region. There were reports of people in that region saying that they were getting attacked by seven foot tall flying aliens. Okay, and so this news story, it, we this news story followed a very interesting progression because it all this had been going on for a while, but when it got in the news, it was in the news for maybe like a week, maybe a little bit longer. And the first thing was people in Peru are saying that these seven feet tall, seven foot tall aliens with uh, large heads and yellowish eyes were flying around with some sort of propulsion device. That they could, it was like this pad that they could easily get on and off. And they can move completely silently on these flying pads. They were bulletproof because uh, residents had tried shooting these people flying around on these discs. And what they were doing is they were kidnapping local villagers and cutting their faces off. And there was a photo of a man being carried into town with no face. I've never been able to to really verify the like where that photo came from. I mean, obviously, I mean, it could have been photoshopped, right? But if that sometimes they'll put a photo from like 1992. They're like, oh, the alien invasion of 1992, Peru. Oh, yeah, I remember that, but not this new one. It could be all sorts of things. It could just be them carrying a man through town with no face, as you do. I didn't know the context of the photo, but there's a photo of a guy being carried through town. And when I say he has no face, he's dead, okay? He has, it's like a skeleton face. It's like a spooky costume. And then there was a report of a young girl who got away, a teenage girl who said they tried cutting her face off. 
So those articles like kind of popped up and they were, I don't want to say big news, obviously, like you had politics and world events going on, but you'd see that hop up in the media for a bit. And then you saw a series of articles popping up going, oh, mystery solved. We've figured it out. These weren't actually space aliens. These were illegal gold mine operators. Apparently, Peru does have a problem. They've had it for a long time, pre, pre-alien invasion, of people coming into their country and setting up illegal gold mines. They go, a lot of times, it's criminals running these things. What we believe is happening, this is kind of the debunking of this whole event, because you know, obviously there's a photo of a guy with his face taken off. Again, I don't know when that photo was taken, but... And this girl saying all this stuff, they're interviewing these residents. And the official story was illegal gold mine operators were trying to scare people away from the illegal gold mine. Okay, I'll accept that. That does sound reasonable. But how did they fly? Okay, I mean, like, that's a big thing. If it was just guys running around with shotguns, shooting people in the face, yes, that's bad, right? I'm not saying, oh, that's fine. But how did they fly around? Why were they seven feet tall with big heads and glowing eyes and kind of the pushback was well the big heads is actually like probably a motorcycle helmet or something like that and you're like okay and they go and when the locals shot these guys i mean you there's body armor now you can buy body armor right and i'm like yeah sure i could and if i shot you with the shotgun you'd probably just walk away and i'm like <laughs> scratch my head i'm like ah, okay i guess i know it's a little more complicated than that and there you go. That's we have we have officially debunked this. It was gold mining operation, and it was just people wearing big helmet. And um, you can tell you can tell the official spokesperson is sweating right now. Um, how did it get seven feet tall? And the guy's like, uh, stilts maybe. But the big question is, I'll accept somebody dressing up as the Green Goblin. And I'll, I'll believe all that stuff, or I won't believe it, but. I understand that. But how did they fly? How were they flying? Mean, that's the biggest point. If it was just people walking through the jungle, it wouldn't even be a story. You would go, oh, it's probably like some sort of criminal activity. How were they flying around? And the answer was, well, I mean, it's an illegal operation. And so if you can buy an AK-47, then you could probably buy a jetpack. <laughs> no, no further questions, no further questions. And Official spokesperson walks off stage and you're like, this was basically the first story was aliens invading Peru. And then shortly after that, it was quote unquote solved. It was an illegal gold mining operation. And they actually said these gold miners must have jetpacks to fly around on. So case closed. It was just gold miners. Now I went into longer debunking the official story, the the gold mining and all that stuff in that episode. I'm not going to recap all of that stuff. I'll put it in the show notes. But what's interesting is alien invasion story. Next, we have the illegal gold mining story. And then nothing. Right? I mean, have you guys seen anything lately? When I say lately, not in the past two weeks. Because you guys might have seen this article I'm about to talk about. It's nuts. It's so nuts. But between August when I recorded that episode and maybe like a week or two ago... I hadn't heard anything. I hadn't heard anything at all, and I figured that, well, maybe it was gold miners. And to be fair, I actually didn't even think about it. After I recorded the episode, I didn't even really think about it anymore. The article stopped being published after I did the episode, didn't even think about it. Check this out, dude. This is, this is crazy. So in October of 2023, way after all of the media coverage, There's an American explorer named Timothy Albarino. He has a YouTube channel. I was looking at it. He does cover a lot of alien stuff as well. I don't know if he would classify himself as a UFOologist, but he's an American explorer. He does seem to specialize in alien stuff, or at least the videos that I saw, alien theories. He said, because he's an explorer, right? I'm just the dude sitting in a chair recording a podcast. I love all this stuff, but... It's not even that I don't have the means. Even if I had a million dollars, I would not feel comfortable. I would not feel comfortable going to Peru and just walking around the jungle. This guy, Timothy Alberino, and his friend, a guy named Doug Thornton, who's an, also an ex-Marine, they went to this area to find out 
what's going on. And before he got there, I mean, obviously he didn't show up, right? He wanted to make sure that there were people to talk to, that it was still going on. He started communicating with people in that area where this specifically was taking place. And they're like, yeah, it's totally still going on. We're still running into these seven foot tall guys on these flying platforms. Like the media is not covering it anymore, but it's still happening. So once he verified that, he went out there with Doug and he didn't just go out there to film stuff for his YouTube channel. Apparently, he brought... Because he... This is... this is what Think about it. Now this has been going on for quite a while. We covered it in August. I think it started in July. It's October. And the, the residents of town are like, we don't feel comfortable leaving the villages. Like, we don't want to go out to our farms. We don't want to take care of our livestock or go pick pineapples to eat. He goes, it's pretty much destroyed our economy. <laughs> that would happen if there's, a giant, if there's a bunch of giant aliens floating around. So he brought in a bunch of supplies for them. He brought in supplies. He brought in a lot of food. And it's funny because I was reading this article. It said he also, him and Doug also taught them how to use rifles. And I go, I mean, yeah, that's cool, right? I got no problem with learning how to use a firearm effectively and safely. But, did they, did they have any rifles? Like, that would be awesome to show up and be like, this is how you shoot an AR-15. And then you put it back, well, you put it back in your car, they're all, any questions? They're like, yeah, can I have one? And he's like, no. I'm wondering if he brought them weapons. Right? I mean, maybe he was showing them how to effectively use the rifles and the shotguns they already had, but I wonder if he actually, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to talk to this dude or anything. I didn't think it was interesting. I would assume if you had a rifle, you would know how to be decent with it, especially if you were in an area that was outside of a city. Because I, I, I know like a lot of hillbillies are pretty good with their guns because they're always shooting, <laughs> they're always shooting squirrels, they're always shooting at trespassers. But I don't know. I'm not saying I'm not officially accusing Timothy of importing firearms into the country of Peru. I was just wondering. Anyways, he uh, brought in supplies, food, taught him how to use the rifles. When him and Doug got there, they were told, yeah, it's still going on. And what's super interesting about this is now we have an escalation. This is what's so weird about this. The media is not covering this part as much as they did the original story. They covered the original story. They covered the official explanation, but now... We're getting just little bits of information, articles here and there. It's nowhere like the coverage over the summer. What's going on is that the locals are going on nightly patrols to try to flush these guys out, to keep them away. They've actually burned down five acres of trees around the village so they have a better view. These guys can't sneak up on them as well. They've also spotted... So that's what they're doing, but the the aliens or whatever they are we'll get to that in a second timothy has an explanation for that now it's not just guys flying around on platforms what's been cited is a vehicle a flying vehicle it's as big as a helicopter but it's shaped like an acorn flying around i mean come on dude at certain point this is just like cobra this is gi joe versus cobra they're just getting these weird vehicles out there there's this acorn-shaped vehicle that will fly around the area almost like a mothership. Big as a helicopter, they'll see it flying around. We also, and this was covered in those early articles, we talked about it on the episode as well, there was the story of Talia. I don't know if we even knew her name back then. I don't know if we, I don't know if we even knew her name originally, but we got a lot more information from her of what happened, because I don't think I had these details before. Timothy interviewed Talia, and she was the girl who almost got her face peeled off. This was like the big story when this all happened, because they had the story of the guy actually getting killed and having his face pulled off. I think all of the news stories that broke this were talking about a young girl who almost had her face cut off. There's video footage of her with a mark on her face. Talia, she's 15 years old. She told the story that she was out picking fruit in the garden. She was not in the outskirts of the jungle. She was right in the community, but it borders on this jungle. 
you know, she's not just out in the middle of nowhere. She goes, I was picking fruit in the garden, and all of a sudden I heard someone moving through the bushes. And I turn around, and there's this thing, you know, a humanoid, a man in a suit we don't know. He's riding a glowing platform, is how she described it. And he grabbed her mouth, covered it, so she can't scream. And she goes, that's when a second one of these people showed up, and he grabbed her legs, and they dragged her behind the chicken coop. Again, like, it's not in the middle of nowhere. It's not in... I mean, that's pretty audacious, truly. You're not worried about getting caught or stopped, apparently, if you're doing it that close. One of the men shoved a syringe up her nose and then began to smear a cream all over her face. And that's, I, again, I think these are all new details. I don't remember knowing any of this earlier. That's when Talia heard them speak. And the fact that she understood it makes me think they're speaking, speaking Spanish, which makes us think more that this is a criminal operation in town as opposed to an alien invasion. But they, they, I mean, okay, let's get to this. She goes, they smeared this cream all over my face. And that's when I heard... The other guy goes, you're using too much cream. You're using too much cream. It's going to, quote, ruin the flesh. Unquote. And make the skin harder to remove. Peel her face off. They're going to take her face off. And she's hearing this conversation. She says, I reached up, grabbed one of their helmets. A brief scuffle broke out. And she was able to get the man's hand off of her mouth and she begins screaming and that's when the residents run over and these two entities fled the scene. And she was apparently in a chemically induced semi-conscious state. That's how it was described for a, a mo- for a while after this attack. This is still going on. He was down there in October He was talking to the residents. They say, we still have this problem. This is what we're doing. We're not getting the media attention anymore. The reason why this story came out, because I think he just, because he just recently uploaded this YouTube video to his channel. So now some of the news sites are kind of getting word of that and they are linking to his YouTube channel and, and all of that. I'll put all the videos and stuff in the show notes, but that's why it's coming back into the news. No one was interviewing these people for the past, at least not internationally. It could have still been a local news story, but it wasn't reaching the rest of the world. Now it's on YouTube and people are starting to look into it again. So it is still going on. And this is where you really have to pick your poison because we don't know what's, we don't, we say it's still going on, but we don't know what it is. So this is where you have to pick your poison. Do you think, or what would you rather have? Because the phenomenon is real at this point. It's just way too, it's been going on for months and months and months. Like, Something is happening, whether it's human or alien, that's the question. Would you rather it be a small group of alien invaders who are scouting out a planet or running some sort of series of experiments or they just have some crazy face fetish, but they're from another world or from another dimension or from within our own world and the vast cave systems that are just miles underneath our feet? Or... This is what Timothy uh, stated. He goes, quote, worst case scenario. He's not he's just not really thinking the alien thing, but he does look into aliens. Worst case scenario, this is an international organization of organ harvesters or sex traffickers who are in possession of top secret hardware and they are using it to do something very sinister. I honestly believe that's what we're dealing with here. Unquote. So, okay, this is your choice, right? Aliens or organ harvesters slash sex predators with not even state-of-the-art technology. Like, I mean, a, a flying device that's silent, that right there is something we do not have. So what would you rather know exists in the world? Alien invaders who aren't, like, nice, right? I mean, one thing they're coming down to cure all of our diseases. No, they're coming down to cure the skin of our face. Nibble it up like beef jerky. 
would you rather have mean aliens on Earth or sex predators with with hoverboards and bulletproof armor and glowing yellow eyes? It really is a pick your poison thing. Crazy stuff, though. The story's still going on. That's what I think is the craziest part, is that it's still going on. And since it was officially debunked, most media outlets aren't covering it anymore. Because they go, oh, it was a legal gold mining thing. But even back then, you're like, well, yeah, but if it's illegal gold miners with <laughs> jetpacks with technology that shouldn't exist, shouldn't we still be covering this? Nah. Let's talk about something else. So, interesting story. I don't often do updates, but... We'll keep an eye on this one. Like, I kind of forgot about it the first time, but now I think it will be something we'll try to follow up on. Hopefully not, right? Hopefully this is the end of it. Hopefully no one else gets their face peeled off. Because in stories like this, you go, well, yeah, Jason, the one guy, the one guy got his face peeled off. She almost got her face peeled off. In a community, you can go, hey, where's Talia? And you can keep track of the people in your community. Anyone just passing through the area, anyone who is homeless or um, a migrant worker, they could disappear. No one would ever know. So the amount of people getting attacked by these things could be much higher. We don't actually know how big of a region they're operating in. All these stories come out of this one particular area. They could be hunting down not even other villages, not even other towns, but just people who are kind of passing from area to area. And if they disappeared, nobody would know that they fell prey to the face peelers. And whoever they are, they're something. We just don't know what. Human or alien, you choose. You choose which one is scarier. An idea, guy. Let's go ahead and wave goodbye, <laughs> wave goodbye to the face peelers before they notice our soft, soft skin, our soft, supple skin wrapped around our cheekbones. I'm going to go ahead and toss you the keys to the carpenter copter. We are leaving behind Peru. We wish you guys the best. Fly us all the way out to Kansas. <laughs> we're headed out to Kansas. Specifically, we're headed out to Parsons, Kansas. And I hope you guys brought your work overalls. <laughs> you have a list of stuff you have to have before you listen to an episode. You need work overalls, a safety hat, gloves that are shrapnel proof. <laughs> You're like, what? What? Where am I going to get those? From the Peru aliens? You need gloves that will withstand multiple pieces of shrapnel coming at you. Probably also goggles, right? You protect your eyeballs. Hope you guys got all that stuff. We're walking into the Kansas Army Ammunition Plant. We walk into the Kansas Army ammunition plant and there's a bunch of people just working. They're building bombs. Hey, Barney, look at all these bombs I built. He's all juggling them and stuff like that. He's such a show off. Look at me. Do, 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 do. Juggling them. Probably not a good place to practice your juggling skills. Although I will say if you can do it here, you can do it anywhere. The pressure is definitely on when you're juggling bombs. This place specifically didn't make bombs. I just kept saying the word over and over again. They made mortars. Mortars. So those are the ones that you put in the tube and they go. They blow up way far away from you. You put them in a tube. Those are always like the hardest ones. Like dropping bombs is easy. You're flying a plane and then you see a city and you're like, boop. And then a bunch of bombs fall. Mortars, you have like measurements. You have like this nerd standing next to you with goggles and he's like 37 degrees and a lick to the west. Hmm. And then you're like, shut up, nerd. <laughs> you're shooting him, shooting mortars. You do have to do what he says, because he's right. 37 degrees. <laughs> Click it up. A lick to the west. Doop. And then you drop the mortar into the tube, and then... Boom. Another direct hit. Math wins again. Good old mortars. That's what they made at the Kansas Army Ammunition Plant. And specifically, they didn't just make any old mortar. They made cluster bombs. Actually, so that's why I kept saying bombs. There are bombs. <laughs> I'm confused. Wait, I think it's a cluster bomb. Goes in a mortar. Maybe they drop from a plane. I don't know. I don't know. But the point is, is I just like the end of that sound effect. Boop. <sighs> Mathematics. Mathematics will win any war. They made cluster bombs. And basically, it is what it sounds like. It's a bomb with a bunch of mini with a bunch of miniature bombs in it. And they were creating these things called Blue 97s. These bombs were designed to punch a hole through five inches of armor plating. 
then shoot a bunch of shrapnel out, and just to, you know, put the little chef's kiss on your killing device, there was a little tiny ring of this very specific type of metal that when the, <laughs> imagine you're sitting in a tank, right? Everything's going great. And then all of a sudden, a bunch of cluster bombs. It might not go through tank armor. Let's say you're sitting in a Humvee. Everything's going great. And then all of a sudden, a, a, bomb, a bunch of, there's a bunch of these too. There's like 200 of these cluster bombs in each bigger bomb. They're called bomblets. These um, little guys punch through the armor plating and then hit you with a bunch of shrapnel. And if you happen to survive that, that little tiny ring of special metal on each one of these is um, an ignition source. So then you burn. You burn up. If you survive the blast, and you survive the shrapnel, oh, well, you're on fire now. Terrible, terrible weapon, but weapons of war often are. They're making millions of these bomblets here, and they had a assembly line to do it on. I don't know if it had, like, the the conveyor belt, like I Love Lucy, but they basically were transferring bombs from one workstation to the next. So some guy was probably like painting the metal and he's like, a job well done. That looks cool. And then the other guy's actually like putting the explosives in it, attaching the fuse. There's this process. And these things are so dangerous. Obviously, they're bombs, right? The workspaces had these huge steel walls dividing them so if something went wrong it would be limited to your workstation july 26 1989 building 1113 it's 420 in the afternoon there's five people working on the line think about it, that 420 you're almost out of work you're probably like oh dude i can't wait to get home build <laughs> i also build bombs at home i'm a terrorist you're you're watching the clock you can't wait to get off there's this uh, part of the assembly process where you have five people standing in this area with these huge steel walls. And apparently what they figured out was when they were, when they were attaching the fuse to one of these bombs, it exploded. These things were used to punch holes through armor plating if you're standing next to one. With no armor plate, with no armor plating, it's not going to end well. Horrific explosion. There were five people in this work area. Only two of them died. The other three, the other three were injured by the shockwave and shrapnel. Yes, but they survived. But only two people died. Luckily, one of the survivors, a guy named Martin Bartholomew. He was about three feet away when this went off. He said he felt the shockwave hit him and then the shrapnel, which he kind of expected. And this is what you wouldn't expect. You figure, uh-oh, bomb, shockwave, ugh, shrapnel, ugh. And then he immediately felt a bunch of wet chunks hit him. He's like, what? What would you what what was that? Do we put that in the bomb now? It was the remains of one of his coworkers, Gerald Jenkinson. He was getting peppered with body parts and guts and skin and flesh and organs. Just he Gerald was pretty much blasted into oblivion. And Martin was now covered in his gore. The two people who died were Gerald Jenkinson and Shirley Lever. Lever. After the workers were evacuated, they had to bring in a bomb team because they didn't know what happened. <laughs> you would be like, well, back to work, guys. It's, time's almost up. It's almost time to go home. First beer's on me. No, you have to evacuate it. You don't know what caused the accident. You don't know if there's going to be even more problems. The bomb disposal team came in and Shirley apparently was like slumped over the table. And the bomb disposal team goes, there might be a bomb underneath her. There might be an active bomb. So they had to very, very carefully move her 
Because again, you don't know exactly what happened. There still were bombs in their workspace. I don't know how they didn't blow up. But I guess cluster bombs were designed not to all blow each other up. Shirley was dead, but there was no bomb underneath her. Uh, Gerald, apparently, I found different sources. Apparently, he was the way he was standing was on this. He wasn't on it. He was standing next to the steel work table. So when the blast went off, it pretty much destroyed his upper body. But his legs just slumped down because they were protected from the blast. So his legs were just laying there on the ground, but the rest of them was gone. Martin got hit by a couple of these pieces. And the bomb disposal team, because now they've realized there are no other bombs ready to go off. They're trying to figure out what it is. They said for the next few days after the explosion... They said while they were actually investigating, trying to figure out what happened, every so often, <laughs> what was that? Where, what was that? And they'd go over and they'd look, and there'd be just a bloody piece of muscle laying on the ground. A while later, <laughs> pieces of Gerald were still dropping from the ceiling. The blast was that great. He like stuck to places in the building. And every so often when that blood would dry, it would no longer be so sticky. It would just fall from the ceiling and hit the ground. If you think I'm making this up, if you think I'm making this up, I did get this from the New York Times, this story. But now we're going to go, that part of it is real. As creepy and disturbing as that is, now we are going to go to the realm of the weird. Because it's just a disaster story. That's sad. But now we're going to go to the ghost side of this. Because I originally found out about this place on the Shadowlands.net. And then I read this ghost story and I go, that's cool. Does, Does any of this true? And I went and I found the plant. Found that there really was an explosion. Found this New York Times article going into great gory detail about it. It's 1990 now. It's the Persian Gulf War is just starting off, the first one. And the plant is now reopened. Apparently there was a time period where it was either in a... Because nobody wanted to work there, right? Nobody wanted to work there, but it was good pay. And I think it might have been in kind of a... Like hibernation, like I've been reading articles and they're talking about uh, Martin Bartholomew at a certain point became a caretaker's not the right word, but he still worked at the plant, but he just kind of like walked around and monitored stuff. I don't know if they were actively in production, but in 1990, they did fire the plant back up. They were going to start making these cluster bombs again. This time to prevent a disaster like that, they widely spaced out all of the work areas. They were really afraid of multiple bombs going off. In a, in a way, they were lucky that only two people died. Not lucky for those two people, but lucky for everybody else. Since everything was more spread out now, apparently the work areas were hundreds of yards apart. And the way to get from one place to the other was by bicycle. Because if you were like an inspector or a manager or someone who has to talk to multiple employees at once before you just whip out your phone and send an email... Instead of walking several hundred yards between workstations, you're like, hey, do you got those bombs ready yet? And they're like, no, Jerry's still working on the fuses. And you're like, let me go talk to Jerry. And you you walk several football fields. And you're like, Jerry, he says he needs the fuses. The fuses? I gave the fuses to Mary. And you're like, oh, man. And Mary's all the way across the plant. You're like, ah. Uh. They have bicycles. They have bicycles. And they have, I don't, I because I, I wasn't able to actually visually see the plant. <laughs> Obviously, I can't astral project. I'm not a remote viewer, but. I was hoping to see something. Apparently, to facilitate the bikes getting all over the place, they built these ramps. Because you couldn't use stairs, obviously, unless you're, like, super radical. You're all spinning the handlebars. You're like, look at me. They're like, dude, this is a palm plant. Oh, that's the other thing. The bikes had old-fashioned baskets. Not, like, the wicker baskets, but, like, a wire basket on the handlebars. So you could transport stuff from workstation to workstation. You're like, okay... You know, like signatures and occasionally bombs. Sometimes you have to put a bomb in this little bicycle and ride it around. Now, connecting the workstations, they would have, they built these wooden ramps. Because you couldn't take them up the stairs. 
And the Shadowlands specifically said that they were ramshackle, unpainted, wasp-infested wooden ramps. Which makes me think that somebody who works... Somebody who... Because that's pretty detailed, right? If they just said ramshackle ramps, wouldn't have thought anything of it. Wasp-infested. I bet you anything whoever wrote this used to work there. The guys on the bikes, the managers and such, would ride their bicycles around. And they would have a little bell on it. Ding, ding. The ling ling, so you could let people know you were coming because you, you are on a bicycle that has inert bombs. They're not gonna go off if you if you bail, but still, you I mean, if, whether or not the bomb, I mean, it's inert, hopefully, but you have a little bell. Ling 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 ling. Ghost stories start to spread. People are saying that they're seeing the phantoms of these two people in building 1113. A lot of people are just blowing the stories off, not believing them. Some people are. <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. There's, difference. There's a big difference between going to a haunted house and they're like, back in 1808, a young woman slit her wrists because her lover said no. And now she haunts the kitchen. Right? There's a big difference between that and two years ago, your co-workers blew up building the same thing you're building right now. And their souls walk the earth to this day. There's there's a big difference between those two stories. People, some people ignored it. Some people were concerned. And obviously, some people were curious. So apparently, one night, two inspectors, bomb inspectors, right? Not like paranormal inspectors. Two inspectors and a parts manager said, let's go over to... This really story should tell you the truth that nobody ever is too old to go ghost hunting. These guys work at this factory and they go, hey, it's late at night. Building 1113 is empty and the lights are off. Let's go there and see if we see a ghost. And they're like, yeah, dude, that's totally... Bombs are blowing up behind them. They're like, oh, we'll inspect those bombs later. Let's go find out if this ghost story is true. So they went into building 1113 at night. The lights are off. They show up and that's when they realize, oh, none of us brought a flashlight. <laughs> We're going into this dark building at night. They hadn't thought about it. Kind of just walking through the darkness... They got about 100 feet into the building, and all of a sudden the room cooled. They felt a noticeable temperature drop. And they just continue walking around the building, and that's when they hear a... Bring, bring. Bring, bring. They're waiting for a bike to come by. Probably someone saying, hey, knuckleheads. Shouldn't you be inspecting bombs? What are you doing here in this empty building? So they wait a moment. They're just staring in the darkness and they hear a bring, bring. Bring, bring. And the three men looked at each other and they're like, screw it. <laughs> Let's get out of here, man. This is too spooky. Could be someone pulling a prank on us. That's what they thought initially. They go... Could be someone pulling a prank on us, but we don't know how they would have got here ahead of us. It was clearly the sound of one of the bike bells, but we didn't see anyone in the darkness. And we don't know how they would have gotten ahead of us. It wasn't coming from behind us. So they figured maybe the story of building 1113 being haunted is true. But that's not the main reason I wanted to tell this story. And I'll tell you that could easily be a prank, right? If you knew generally people would be talking about ghosts for a long time. And it'd be like, we should go in that building some night. And someone else goes, yeah. And then they don't do it for a couple of weeks. And then finally they decide to do it. And someone could have overheard all of that and gotten there a half hour early and ring the bell in the darkness to scare them. What's interesting, the reason why I say that, listen, it could have been a genuine ghost haunting. I think that that could have been someone pulling a prank. I really do. That would be my first guess as opposed to paranormal event. But that's not the main reason why I wanted to talk about that story. I found an interesting little bit in this, before the ghost sighting started. Before the ghost sighting started. So we had the disaster when the bombs went off. Gerald and Shirley died. And then we have the ghost sightings later. But in the middle of those two things... This is super weird. It's one of those things that just kind of caught my eye. Before the ghosts began to appear, to other people, the survivors of the blast, the ones who came back to work, began to have nightmares. I don't know if one of these was actually Martin, because there were three people, other people who survived the blast, but one of the survivors 
they'd have this reoccurring nightmare that they were in, they would be running through the factory. Oh my God. Oh my God, stop. They'd be running through the factory. They'd be running up and down these wooden ramps in the dark. Fast in pursuit right behind them was Shirley. Her face completely shredded with shrapnel. The other survivor, this is weird, the other survivor had a different dream. He would dream he would be in the factory and he would see Gerald, but only from the waist down. Everything that was blown to pieces was gone. It was just this waist and then the legs and the feet, obviously. He would just see the legs of Gerald running around wildly throughout the factory. He'd say running like a chicken with its head cut off, but that's almost exactly what it was. It was just the legs of a man panicking, scurrying around. They had the nightmares before the ghost started to appear to other people. And I'm curious about this. We'll wrap it up like this. I don't want it to go too long, but I wonder if, because we talk so much about ghosts appearing in dreams. I wonder if that is the kind of the unknown connection between ghosts being able to materialize in our world. The idea always is, is that ghosts need to leach energy off of something. That's why batteries stop working. That's why, and I know skeptics say this, but it's convenient that cameras don't work or recording devices don't work because they're actually draining the energy from these types of devices. I wonder if, and so many people, there are people who will never see a ghost in real life will dream that a dead loved one comes to them. It's a very common dream after death, and you could just say it's you know the body reconciling. You could just say it's the subconscious reconciling with death. You could say that is actually that person sending you one last goodbye. But what if that is, and I'm not saying that you're <laughs> very clear when your grandma came to you and said goodbye to you, I'm not saying she did this. But I wonder if when a ghost does appear in your dreams, I wonder if that is the first step to gaining enough energy to being seen in the real world. Because it's always almost been the missing link, like somebody dies. And there seems to be a short period of time before they're visible in the real world. We don't really know why. It's very rare. There are accounts of people dying and their ghost immediately appearing. I don't know if I've done that story yet. I'll have to look into that because I have a story where that happens. It was immediate. But generally, there is a period of time. And I wonder if there that is the first quote-unquote battery to drain from is humans. Because think about the emotional energy you generate when you are dreaming, and it has to be even more that when you're having a nightmare. I find that chain of events very, very interesting that they die, the nightmares start. And it says the the survivors who went back to work they probably had nightmares about the actual event because of course you saw two people blow up you almost got blown up yourself i'm sure they had nightmares but it's two of the survivors who went back to work is what it says then they start having the nightmares so it's like they're back in the location where the accidents happened where these two people where their soul may have been stuck and the two people who had a very close connection to that you know they were almost dead as well now these entities, these uh, spirits have attached themselves to the survivors and they begin to slowly draw energy. And I'm not even really saying that Gerald or Shirley are negative. I mean, I did use the term draining energy, but they might just be doing what comes natural to a spirit. They may not be thinking, ah, oh, we're after them because they survived. But it, I find that very, very interesting connection and i wonder if there's more to that do ghosts need to appear in our dreams is that the first step and that's why there seems to be this 
gap between the time of the death and the time of the ghost appearing? Are they slowly gathering up energy? Because we don't know much about or really anything about ghosts. We're always still trying to figure this out. But is that a way for them to... Did I do the story yet about the guy who... Um, he, he was a ghost, and he when he appeared to someone, he goes, the reason why you have restless spirits... Did I do that story yet? I'm going to have to look and see if I did that as well. And if not, those will be two stories I do next week. But, um, yeah, intro- I love ghost theory. I, I know I know it can get a little weird sometimes, but I really think like that's the key to finding out just one little piece of the phenomenon. And we got all this stuff, right? Even if tomorrow we learned everything there is to know about ghosts, like everything... Proof of life after death. We know why you become a ghost, who becomes a ghost, how to avoid becoming a ghost if you don't want to be. Even if we knew all of that stuff tomorrow, we still don't know what's going on in Peru. We still don't know if it's a bunch of sex traffickers stealing people's faces or if it's an alien scout party. Um, that's the great thing about the paranormal. If tomorrow we knew for a fact that Bigfoot was real, we got footage of him. He's walking down the street. He's running for mayor. Fantastic. Great. Vote vote for Bigfoot. But we'd still have so many other subjects to explore. And I hope you stick around with us as we continue to explore them. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash DeadRabbitRadio. TikTok is at DeadRabbitRadio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day. I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great weekend, guys.